very much for being here this morning. I'm Marty Kaplan. I'm the director of the Norman Lear Center. And I am in a particularly blessed position this morning because I can tell you uh, how fortunate I am that the kind of work that we do at the Lear Center is made possible uh, because of the generosity and commitment of a guy whom I love who is here. So please say hi to Norman Lear. Yes. We are being live webcast, and so uh, in principle, there are thousands of people who care about these issues, who are watching, and uh, lots of organizations with grassroots members around the country plugged into that, so a shout out to all of them. Um, there was a poll that the uh, Pew Research Center put out last week, and it said that local news is the number one source of news in the country. 78% of Americans watch and get their news from local news. So if you care about the quality of democracy, you have to care about the quality of local news. Uh, the Lear Center has been involved in local news in two ways uh, for more than a decade now. Uh, one of those ways is that every two years we give out Scott, could you lower the lights, please? We give out an award called the Walter Cronkite Award for excellence in television political journalism. We do it right here in this building, and it's to honor people who do a terrific job as news directors, correspondents, station group owners, and producers. And we want to shine a spotlight on terrific work that they're doing. Those are just a, a handful of examples. This is not that day. <laughs> we also, for over a decade, have been collecting empirical data about the content of local news, starting in the 1998 California gubernatorial election, extending to more than 50 media markets nationally. And those reports are a way to turn anecdotes into data, which we hope uh, is useful to policymakers and legislators. And in fact, we've been fortunate that the data that we've been putting out uh, has made its way to the FCC and the relevant congressional committees and, and to activists. So it's in that tradition uh, that we're meeting here today. We're going to be releasing today the first round of findings from our most uh, recent study, which focuses on the LA media market. And uh, I want to thank the Los Angeles Civic Alliance for funding this study. You'll meet the chair of the Civic Alliance in a bit, but, but thank you very much for, for uh, committing to do uh, this kind of research. It's very labor intensive. It costs a lot of money and time. And uh, without your support, the group of uh, civic-minded leaders from across the city this would not uh, be possible. So to help understand the context of what we're doing, how this particular study fits into the picture of what local news is in the, uh, in the, in the national context as it fits into uh, regulatory policy, public policy more broadly, and to the, the quality of our national life, uh, I'm, we have the absolute perfect person here to do it. Um, he is a friend, he is a, a, a great uh, patriot, he has fought for high quality uh, uh, news and uh, communication in the public interest for now almost 10 years on the Federal Communication Commission. He's had experience in other branches of government. Please join me in welcoming Mike Cops. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Marty, for that very nice, uh, although overly generous introduction. We have a mutual admiration society going, I think. But I am so really pleased to be here this morning as the Norman Lear Center of the Annenberg School for Communications and Journalism releases this very important report. And I'm so happy to see a lot of old friends here. I really appreciate it. Mr. Lear, it's a delight to see, uh, see you again. Uh, thank you all for coming. This study focuses on the state of news in the Los Angeles market, as Marty just said. And the question is, 
Are the people of Los Angeles getting the news and the information that they need to be fully informed and fully engaged in the discussions and decisions that are going to be made affecting the future of this community? This report, which Marty will be giving you more details on, demonstrates that all is not well here in Los Angeles. When a half-hour news show is broadcast and citizens are hard-pressed to find half a minute of in-depth local news coverage, something is wrong. And I'm not here to pick on the good citizens of Los Angeles because I've traveled the country and what I've seen and sensed without benefit of the kind of documentation that this report has for Los Angeles, what I've seen and sensed is the same kind of phenomenon almost everywhere that I go. Journalism, broadcast journalism, and newspaper journalism is in trouble. I think we all know that. Beat reporters no longer <clears throat> pounding the pavement. Investigative journalism becoming pretty much of an endangered species. Uh, pink slips in the newsroom as common as pay checks. Infotainment, glitzy infotainment, replacing too often real substantive and hard news. Watchdog journalism. Did you know that 27 states in this country of ours, over half of our states, do not have a single reporter accredited to Capitol Hill to watch your representatives and mine in Washington? How do you have watchdog journalism? How do you hold the powerful accountable when nobody is there watching? Should we be surprised at some of the things that go on? I'm not going to go into a long analysis this morning of how things got this way. I suppose conventional wisdom would just say, well, it's a bad economy, plus you've got the rise of the internet coming, and don't worry, that'll take care of everything uh, uh, air long, and we don't need to be terribly concerned about this. I think the conventional wisdom is missing the greater part of the story because the problem goes a lot deeper and started a lot sooner than that. And I think the locus of that problem is really in a series of bad decisions made in both America's business sector and in America's governmental sector, particularly in Washington, D.C., and more particularly at the place where I work, the Federal Communications Commission. On the business side, we've had 20 years and more now of hyper-speculative media consolidation. Fewer and fewer big media behemoths gobbling up more and more stations, more and more radio stations, more and more television stations, and taking a lot of the local out of local broadcasting, and taking a lot of diversity out of the diversity of America. You know, the cost-cutting that always accompanies that kind of consolidation, I think, has, has really, uh, really thrust a dagger into the heart of broadcast journalism. Uh, on the government side, and I think this may be equally pernicious, if not more so, we've had 30 years and more, with maybe an exception uh, along the way for a few years, of the very proactive dismantling of public interest oversight of our broadcast media. And that extends beyond just broadcast because you have so many combinations of newspapers and broadcasts. So this dereliction, and that's the word for it, this dereliction of our public interest oversight responsibilities has just freed broadcasters from having to pay attention to any of the guidelines that we used to have because those guidelines are gone. I hope someday to return. And I, I should say right here that this is not an attack on broadcasters as a whole. I think there are many broadcasters in this country, particularly those who've been uh, affiliated with smaller independent companies or who have had broadcasting in the family for years and years, have a pride in it, who really didn't like the direction that this was going. But less and less are they captains of their own fate 
and more and more are they captives of the unforgiving expectations of Wall Street and Madison Avenue. And it's been, you know, if you're making 20% this year, that's pretty good, pretty good return. A lot of them doing that until recently, and I think it's coming back now. But the message from Wall Street, if you're doing 20% this year, you've got to do 25 next year. If you do 25 next year, it's got to be 30% the year after that. How do you do that? You've got to cut corners. And where do they look to cut? Where do the consolidators look to cut when they take over the new station? Close the newsroom, fire some reporters, join forces with another station. The cost is loss of a local voice within a community. So these uh, broadcasters who I think still had the flame of the public interest burning in their uh, hearts found it uh, harder and harder to, uh, to survive. It's kind of play the game or get voted off the island. And the first thing that didn't survive was news and information. I believe that uh, uh, reports like this one from the Lear Center today are really a summons to action. And my takeaway is that we'd better pay a lot more attention to what's happening to broadcast news and newspaper journalism, tradi call it traditional journalism, and figure out how to fix it. Because this study and others too show how people still rely, as Marty said, on traditional journalism. That's where the news mostly originates. That's where most of the news on the internet originates. And that's the news and information that people are going to. So if traditional media disappeared from the face of the earth tomorrow morning at sunup, the bulk of the news and information that we get would be gone. It's as simple as that. The internet would be on a starvation diet just like we would all be on a starvation diet. Maybe one day, you know, that internet will uh, uh, will find the models and find the way to support uh, journalism uh, and take us into that new age. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. I hope it's on the road to happening. If we're smart about it, if we're really smart about it, we can make it happen. But it hasn't happened yet, and I'd have to conclude at this point that really what we have gained from the internet in terms of news and information has not yet counterbalanced what we have lost in the way of traditional media. And that's a serious problem for America. So we are, uh, we are really risking a lot uh, with the policies that we've got right now. I think we're flying with a pretty much uh, a half empty gas tank when it comes to news and information. And we shouldn't expect citizens to be able to do their best jobs when their journalism is running on half empty. Now the fixes for this will not be simple or easy. I don't have, I don't think anybody has, a silver bullet for us. But there are some things we can start doing now. And then there are some longer term things that we have to begin discussing and debating. I'll start with where I work, the Federal Communications Commission. I'd like to see and I hope soon, a return to doing the job that we were supposed to be doing all those years, which is holding broadcasters to the deal they made when they got their licenses. Their green light to use the people's airwaves, always underline that. Nobody owns a piece of the airwaves in this country. No company owns a piece of the airwaves. They belong to the American people. And what we have neglected to do is to hold people responsible who have those licenses for their stewardship. Yes, we want broadcasters to make a good living off of those stations. That's important. But somehow we have gotten ourselves into the mindset or accepting the mindset of uh, set by Wall Street and some of these other folks I was talking about before that somehow the news has to be the profit center, the driver of the station's prosperity. And I think given the fact that we're using a public resource here, that we've got to start moving a little bit away from that view of the news and information responsibilities of our broadcasters. So I'd like us to, you know, once upon a time, we did take this more seriously. 
we had a series of, I think, 14 different guidelines back in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, that stations were supposed to follow to demonstrate that they were serving the public interest. Were they going out and talking to the members of the community about what kinds of issues you would like to see on your radio and television stations? Were your programming really reflecting local interests, covering local events, covering, focusing on the local government or on the local economy? And we at least went through the motions of a public interest review of those findings. Now, I'm not here to argue that there was ever a golden age of FCC oversight public interest oversight of the stations. There wasn't, but at least we had those guidelines and at least we had a process that we could use and I think everybody understood that. And it's very interesting how important that is. I've talked to a lot of the old-time journalists. I got to be uh, friends with the late Walter Cronkite after I came to the FCC. People like Walter and Marvin Cal was in my office recently, said the same thing. Uh, uh, talked to Brian Ross, uh, Dan Rath, any of the old timers will tell you that that wonderful era of Ed Murrow journalism that we had in the United States didn't just spring spontaneously from Mother Earth or from the generosity of broadcasters' hearts, although I think broadcasters were more aware of the deal that they had made back then, but some of them are now. It came because they knew that somebody was watching. They knew there was an agency that had the responsibility to make sure this news and information was produced. They knew there was a quid pro quo and they knew that they, they couldn't just present that news as the quote profit center of their station, but that the primary purpose of that news and information was the profit of the American people. In, non-monetary uh, ways, I guess, is the way I would put it. So we need to go back to where we were. We used to give licenses three years. Licensees had three years. And then you had to come in and see if you met those guidelines, and we'd uh, opine uh, pro or con, too often pro, but at least uh, that was uh, the responsibility we had. You know what happens now? The broadcaster sends in once every eight years a postcard like to have my license re-upped, and it's pretty much a slam dunk that he'll get it uh, in very short order back, no questions asked, unless somebody objects, unless somebody here says, I don't want this station to get uh, re-upped. We don't even look, as a matter of course, at the public file that we require them to keep to see what they're doing. We don't even look yet. That is not public interest oversight. That is not holding folks true to stewardship of the public airwaves. So that's what I want to push for right now. So let's shorten that uh, license period uh, somewhat and let's have some public interest guidelines. Not onerous, not regulatory. I'm not uh, advocating that we all put on a little green eye shades at the FCC and spend our time pouring through the records of, uh, uh, of, of local stations. I'm not saying we should get involved in content at all, but I'm saying we should have some way to encourage those stations to use those airwaves to reflect the localism of their community, the diversity of their community, and to provide the news and information that people need to be intelligent and informed citizens. The good news is we're looking now, I think, at an opportunity to move ahead. We have a new administration in Washington. We have a new chairman at the uh, Federal Communications Commission, Julius Janikowski, uh, who very happily agreed to put out a public notice uh, recently to solicit comments and suggestions on a proceeding that he's calling the uh, uh, news and media in the digital age or uh, something like that. How we make sure that communities have the news and information that they need in the digital age. Uh, simultaneously, we are conducting a review of the media ownership rules that go to such things as who can own what stations and how many of them in the, in the community. These are the rules that uh, Chairman Michael Powell tried to eviscerate several years ago when I was out here several times then talking to you all here on, on this campus and elsewhere. We had hearings all over the state uh, about that. People didn't like what he was doing and, uh, and eventually, thanks, thanks to the American people, uh, that effort was uh, stopped and uh, 
the Senate voted to overturn it, and uh, then some of the consumer groups took it to court. It's actually still in court, but at least those rules uh, never went into effect. That doesn't mean that the rules that we are left with are good. They're just better than what Powell wanted to replace them with. But what we need to do now is really take a serious look at the structure of the industry and see what can be done. That's going to take a while to do that study. The other things I'm talking about on the public interest guidelines and the license, we can do that right now. And that's what I really want my colleagues <coughs> to do. So that's important. And we don't have any time to lose on this. Uh, we have a, a little window of reform open in this country right now. Uh, when those windows open historically, you don't know how wide they're open. You don't know how long they're going to stay open. And I don't want to be around here six months or a year from now circling the wagons and saying, why didn't we really push to get this stuff done when we had a chance to get it done? Very quickly, and then I'll, I'll hush, and we're going to have really interesting stuff. But I want to say a word about new media, because so many people are focused on this idea that I mentioned at the outset. Don't worry about all this stuff. You're just kind of uh, an artifact talking about this traditional media. New media is here. New media is going to uh, uh, to solve all our problems. And as I said, maybe one day it will. But I think that migration to new media is going to take a lot longer than most people think. And Marty is right, and these other reports are right. The traditional media is important right now. That's where people are getting their news and information. They're getting less of it, but that's what they're getting, what they're uh, getting. Uh, and we have to start thinking, when this migration occurs, how do we protect the public interest on that new media, on broadband, on the internet, which has been very lightly regulated, which is a very open and dynamic platform and would be very difficult to regulate. It's global, it's you know so uh, free-flowing and all of that. But at the end of the day, isn't it our responsibility to figure out that if we have one mechanism or one media, if it's that broadband and internet, that's going to be the primary venue for all of our communications other than the way we talk to ourselves one-on-one. Uh, uh, -on -one. If it's all going to be there, doesn't that have to serve the public interest? Don't we have to be sure that it's going to nourish that small d democratic dialogue that we have to have, that it's going to support investigative journalism, support the kind of news and information that, uh, that we really need to be informed citizens? How will we support in-depth journalism there? Blogs are wonderful, but you know how many bloggers can afford to set up bureaus around the state or around the country or around the world? Or afford to take all day or a week or two or three weeks on a story? And maybe that story is not going to see, uh, it's not going to see a microphone or a printing press for three months or six months while the investigation is done. That's expensive. That's resource intensive to do that. It's also essential that we have that kind of uh, journalism. And then how do we make sure that that internet doesn't become the province of the affluent, the well-educated, the white, the male? We've had too much of that in traditional media. Let's be awfully sure that if we migrate to a new media that it really is open. It's, it's very easy for all of us to go home and type something into the ether and say, whoopee, I have now expressed myself as in this a wonderful small d democratic mechanism. But who's hearing you? How do you know anybody's hearing you? How do you know a search engine is going to take anybody to your little entry on the internet? That's what this internet openness, network neutrality, inelegantly named network neutrality debate is really all about. How do you make sure that this net stays open, dynamic, welcoming to all, and actually provides opportunity to those people who have been denied opportunity for so, so very, very long? So there's lots and lots uh, uh, to do, but it's really important stuff. Some people think I get a little bit carried away with it, I, I suppose, because whenever I'm out here, this is the issue I talk about. But I don't really think in the final analysis that there are many issues that are more important to the future of our country. So if I went around this room right now and I said, what's the most important issue to you? Somebody might say, well, it's wars we're fighting. We need to do something about that. Somebody might say, no, it's health insurance. We've got 47 million people not covered by health insurance. 
or it's lagging education, or it's the destruction of the uh, climate and the environment, or it's our energy dependence, or it's opening the doors of opportunity for minorities and women. And those are all important issues. And I would just say if one of those is the issue that you're dedicating your public life to, better make this future of the media your second most important issue because that first issue depends upon how it's depicted in the media and how it goes through that funnel and filter of big traditional media and how it will go through the new funnel and filter of the new media and internet media. So if you think that that war issue or insurance issue or education issue or energy issue or environmental issue might fare a little better if we had a little more discussion, a little more depth, a little more diversity to it, then get involved in this. We need you to get involved. And that's why I am here today and I'm here also to really once again thank uh, uh, Marty and, and the Lear Center for, for an extraordinary job in giving us really the documentation and the factual record of what is going on in this country right now. And I think it's a true public service that the Lear Center has once again uh, uh, bestowed upon us. And I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful for the fact that you all have me out here today. Thank you very much. I, for one, am glad you get carried away. <laughs> um, now, on to the. Uh, the data. Uh, I, you're going to meet in uh, at this table in a bit, uh, my collaborator on this work, but Matt, just raise your hand. This is Professor Matthew Hale of Seton Hall University, who's been my collaborator on this work since 1998, uh, when we were both uh, younger. <laughs> so uh, here's what we did. For two months, we recorded every news broadcast on every station in the Los Angeles media market that covers the news. So the LA media market is all of those counties. Eight stations, there are the eight stations. We had two months worth of video. We chose, on a scientific basis, 14 days out of that. And that's round the clock. Uh, almost a thousand half hours of news got analyzed and that's almost 20,000 separately timed segments that people had to watch and code. Uh, more than 11,000 news stories were coded. What do we code for? A huge number of things. Today I'm only going to focus on a few. This is a, a treasure trove of data, and we're only going to be talking about some aspects of it. So we coded for uh, how long the story was, what it was about, whether it took place in Los Angeles, where in the broadcast it aired, uh, what program, what station it aired on. So what is it that we found? This might be the easiest way to sum it up. If you took all of the news in Los Angeles, and combined it into one consolidated typical half hour. This is what you'd find. The largest component is ads, eight minutes and 25 seconds. Then in addition to those paid ads, there are also teasers, which, you know, uh, the Southland's best news, or stay tuned, uh, don't go away, we'll be right back. Those are self-promotion, but they're ads in a way. So that's the next, uh, the other piece of the, the ads. So then you've basically taken uh, 10 and a half minutes. Then the largest other chunk is sports and weather. You can debate whether that's important local news, civic local news or not. That's the next big chunk, weather uh, a big chunk of that. So what you have left is about half of a half hour for news. And of that half of a half hour, ha about half of it doesn't take place in Los Angeles. So the amount of news about Los Angeles, and when I say Los Angeles, I mean all of those counties that I described. So uh, any news of any of those counties on those broadcasts 
gets squeezed in to 8 minutes and 17 seconds. So what is it that is covered inside those 8 minutes and 17 seconds? Well, one of the first questions one might ask when you talk about a public interest obligation is, well, you know, the public's business is done by the government. And again, by government, I mean city government, county government, all levels of government in the entire media market. So how much news of government is carried in a typical half hour of news? 22 seconds. And that 22 seconds has to jam in budget, law enforcement, education, layoffs, new ordinances, voting procedures, personnel changes, health care, transportation, immigration, and the list goes on. All of those things of Los Angeles get covered in a sliver that size. The business and economy of Los Angeles, you could also imagine, is of interest to the public. So 29 seconds get crammed into there. So you might ask, well, what's the rest of the news? Well, here's the rest of the news. Sports and weather, as I mentioned, is about three and a half minutes. Crime, almost three minutes. Crime is, after sports and weather, the number one story on local news. Has been and apparently still is. The kind of stuff that we, when you uh, uh, make uh, jokes about local news, uh, the kind of oddball, uh, soft, uh, you know, ugliest dog contest, uh, cats up trees, that kind of thing, that category is, after crime, the second most important category of news, uh, two and a half minutes. And then entertainment, about two minutes. And by entertainment, I don't mean Los Angeles is uh, the capital of the entertainment industry. This is story of, these are stories about the entertainment industry. No, that goes in business and economy. This is straight entertainment. So that, those are the biggest categories of news. Local news uh, uh, decides what's important by how long it gives to cover something, but also where they put it in the news. The position at the top of a half hour is the most important position. It's what they lead with, it's what they use to make people stick with you. And uh, if you want to know what leads the news in Los Angeles, one out of three lead stories is crime. If it bleeds, it leads. There, that is not uh, a stereotype that falls from the sky. But we have a Los Angeles city government, for example, which is bleeding red ink. Apparently, if it bleeds, it leads, doesn't apply to that. The number of lead stories about the Los Angeles budget, for example, is one out of a hundred. How many leads about Los Angeles business and economy? One out of 200. One out of three, crime. So. How much news overall would you say is civic content in local news? People can define this in different ways. Some people might say, well, traffic is really civically important, or weather is civically important. So everyone's going to have a different definition. There's no official version of it. But here's one take at what you might call civic, civically important news. All coverage of government all coverage of the business and economy of Los Angeles. All of the crime stories that you could argue are civically important, public corruption, uh, police shooting, uh, the uh, police want help finding somebody, offering an award. So that chunk of crime. All the stories about public health of any kind in Los Angeles. There are stories about people, not about government, but about people dealing with things like traffic or immigration or nonprofit organizations with civic activists or people having vigils or fundraisers. All of that news. This study was done during the period of the LA wildfires. Well, if you saw that coverage, it's not obvious that all of it was about one's personal safety, but let's 
call it all civically important. Also in this period were a series of water main breaks uh, in Los Angeles. Let's call all of that civically important. You put all of that together and you come up with about four minutes in half an hour, about 13% of the total air time. So by one measure, a plausible one I think, about four minutes and a half hour is given over to those kinds of issues. There is a variety among stations. So for example, uh, KCAL and KCBS uh, compared to the 13% average, they're at uh, almost 16 and 17%. They did in the eight stations the most of that particular uh, set of stories. And at the other end, uh, KMEX and KCOP at 9 and almost 10%. Interesting thing about KMEX when we're talking about local news, KMEX had six times the amount of international news than any other station. The average was under 30 seconds and they did about two minutes. And arguably the international news that they were covering is for people for whom these are nations of origin, it's a kind of local news. One of the things we also did was to look at the Los Angeles Times. There's a lot of data about TV and about the LA Times. I'm only just going to skim the surface and, and mention a few key points. The Los Angeles Times, if you ask how much of it is local, how much of it is non-local, non-local to local, two to one. So the Los Angeles Times clearly uh, positions itself, thinks of itself as a national newspaper. It's almost the reverse of what you find uh, in local news. They do that little uh, of national news. Um, here's a comparison uh, on some points of LA Times and local news, uh, TV news. Um, I'll, I'll first point to the uh, government and business and economy. I mentioned before that government was 22 seconds, which is about uh, 1.9% uh, of the news hole. Uh, the Los Angeles Times gives 3.3% to local government coverage. That's more, but it's not a huge amount more. But interestingly, if you look at the front page of the LA Times, which you could argue is the equivalent to being a lead story uh, on uh, local TV news, 10% of their front page is given over to uh, LA government coverage. Uh, the uh, business and economy is about double in the uh, paper for local coverage uh, than it is on television. Again, more, but not hugely more. The places where uh, uh, the LA Times puts most of its attention is sports and weather, 25%, and entertainment, uh, 22%. You can see in both cases it's more proportionately of their news hole than the uh, local TV stations did. And again, the entertainment coverage, that is not covering the entertainment industry. That goes in uh, business and government. Uh, that's about entertainment, just the, the, the content itself. Um, the uh, soft oddball news of the bazaar that local news uh, does uh, about 12% uh, of the time for the Times uh, is, is way less than that. Crime, uh, the uh, local news also does, uh, TV news does way more than the LA Times, uh, almost three times as much on television as in the paper. Celebrity crime, just to take a subcomponent of that, was the lead story in, on TV eight times more frequently than it was on the front page of the LA Times. One of the most uh, significant celebrity crime stories covered hugely in local TV during this period was about Ryan Jenkins, the reality TV star accused of murdering his wife who then committed suicide. Frequent, continuing narrative leading in the, at the LA Times that appeared on the front page only once. Um, 
Last week at the FCC, uh, the head of a TV station group uh, was asked whether there were any stations that uh, did not live up to their public interest responsibilities. And he's answered by saying, what's the public interest? There's no such thing as the public interest. There's your public interest, there's my public interest. And he went on to say, we broadcasters as content creators monitor what the public wants on a daily basis. What the public wants. Well, I want ice cream. I need a balanced meal. Apparently, the people of Los Angeles want 22 seconds of coverage of local government. I wonder, if they got more than that, would they want more than that? So on that note, I'm delighted to introduce a distinguished panel who can uh, help us uh, talk about that. And then after talking a bit, we're going to include you in the conversation. So would the panelists please join? Thank you. So uh, on my right is George Kiefer, who, and I'll give you a chance to applaud after I get down the line, who is the chair of the Los Angeles Civic Alliance, and as I mentioned before, it was the Civic Alliance uh, that funded the study. He's an attorney at uh, Manat Phelps and Phillips. Sitting next to him is the executive director of Common Cause of California, a grassroots group. Uh, I'm sure you know Common Cause, Kathy Fung. Thanks for being with us. Um, uh, to Kathy's right is uh, Bob Jimenez, who was a correspondent for NBC Nightly News and was also a KCBS anchor and uh, is now the communications director for the 30th Senate District in California. And next to him is Marsha Brandwin, thank you for being here, who was assistant news director at KTLA and she was also both in front of the camera as, uh, also in front of the camera as a uh, host and as a correspondent, and is now uh, a host on the Live Well Network. And then uh, Matt Hale, whom I introduced before, the uh, co-principal co investigator and professor at, at uh, Seton Hall. So please join me in thanking them for being here. So I just want to start uh, by putting this in a little larger context by asking Matt, so uh, this was one study in one period of time of one, one media market. Is there any way to compare that either to this market in other times or with other media markets? There is. Um, you know, one of the things about doing this research since 1998 is um, we've focused primarily on elections. And so most of the research that we've done is right before the election season um, for coverage of politics, which is, I think, arguably, uh, the most civic type of content that local TV can can portray. Um, that being said, we can still sort of make some comparisons um, between our previous studies um, uh, and different markets. And I, I, there's a couple different examples. Um, in 2004, we looked at 11 different markets around the country, and they range from Dayton, Ohio, to uh, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, to New York City, to Philadelphia, and of course, LA. Um, and we looked at 44 stations in total, um, and we looked at all of the evening news coverage in 2004. And again, this was right before the election, which is, is a civic uh, uh, importance. Um, and what we found is that of those 11 markets, um, Miami and Tampa devoted the most amount of time to election coverage. So Miami was about 15% and Tampa was about 14%. LA, in comparison, was tied with a whole bunch of other markets, including uh, Dayton, uh, um, uh, Philadelphia, and New York City at about 9%. So the best that we found in terms of overall election coverage was Miami and Tampa. LA was tied with a bunch at 9%. The only market that had less in our study was Seattle, which had about 6%. So that gives some content of, of how LA compares with other markets on that. The one area where LA did particularly poorly in that 2004 study was coverage of local elections. 
Um, the best market in that study was Dallas. Um, and about uh, 14 or 15 percent of their coverage was on local elections. They were helped a little bit because they had a big stadium initiative on that ballot that sort of jacked their percentage up a little bit. The number in comparison for LA though was 1.7 percent. So Los Angeles um, uh, overall focused a lot less of the election coverage that they have on local elections. The, the big chunk in 2004 was on presidential election in, in LA. Um, so uh, uh, that gives some sort of civic context to um, the history of, of LA. One of the things that we found in this report is how much crime there was on LA. So I went back and I sort of compared with um, uh, our 2004 study to see how LA ranked in terms of the amount of crime coverage that they had. And what we found is that um, in fact in 2004, seven of the other 11 markets had more crime than LA. So we have a lot, but um, uh, other people may have had more. The, the market with the most amount of crime was Philadelphia. Um, but I think the, the interesting part is that in 2004, um, Philadelphia, 13% of all of their time was devoted to crime. LA came in at about 8%. That compares to the amount of time that we saw today, which is almost a quarter of the uh, uh, total time devoted to crime. So between 2004 and 2010, it seems that the amount of crime coverage has gone up significantly. Well, the um, amount of crime has gone down. Well, the amount of crime has, has gone down. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of an interesting way of, of putting some context on it. Um, and then I'll just sort of wrap up that there were two places where LA in, in 2004 did better than anybody else in the country. LA, Air, LA stations had more ads and more teasers than any other um, market in the country. So we're, LA was the winner on that one. So. Uh, thank you. So uh, George, why did the Civic Alliance want to fund something like this? <clears throat> well, um, this group is a group of, of folks who meet monthly and talk about issues affecting Los Angeles and what they can or cannot do about them. And among the issues, transportation and education have, have always been the media issue about whether uh, we were being properly informed. You may even remember getting involved with the Tribune Company in a number, a couple of three years ago. Uh, there was a feeling, a gut feeling, that we were just not getting enough uh, local news coverage in order for people to make informed decisions about what was happening in their local communities and local government issues. Uh, the city budget and fiscal situation being a perfect example, which has been going on for quite a while, but sort of invisible. Um, so uh, those were just uh, anecdotal kind of feelings. How do we then examine this in some sort of more accurate way where we, we confirm or don't confirm what we're feeling? And that's when we turn to you all at USC and the Norman Lear Center to ask, well, let's see, can you do a study uh, on something? Let's tell us that whether we're feeling is real or not real. And, and I think that uh, we found out that our feelings, unfortunately, were confirmed and that uh, coverage of local news by local television stations in this town is frankly pathetic. Um, and it's an embarrassment to the name of local news. Our real concern is the connection between public voting and public knowledge about issues uh, and, the, uh, and the news and information upon which they have to base those decisions. It's a key part of democracy. It, especially as we become more direct in our democracy with the initiative process and other things, but, it, it, but it's also with the indirect democracy, who we elect, why we elect them, what we pay attention to, what we get excited about. If we do not have that connection between information and the voter and their pressure that they put on our, our, our leaders, then in, in, our, in my judgment, not speaking for the group, only speaking for myself, uh, the republic democracy fails. Uh, we've got a greater obligation uh, as citizens than other kinds of government, but we can't really exercise that obligation unless we know what's going on. And in Los Angeles, frankly, we do not know what is going on. And that's a problem, so we're concerned. Thank you. So, um, Kathy, what can any concerned citizen do about that? I'm glad you asked. Uh, I think that there actually are a couple of um, concrete things that people can do. And I think that Mike Copps, in talking about the change in the composition of the FCC, gives us a little bit of hope. Um, and um, 
uh, I'm going to borrow a lot of ideas from other people. I don't claim ownership. I think that these are ones that have been around for a while, but unfortunately, over the last three decades, they haven't met with a very receptive audience, and now we have a potentially receptive audience in the new uh, composition of the FCC. The first one that Mike Copps talked about was the FCC public interest guidelines, that we need to reinstitute something that sets some standards for broadcasters to live up to. If we create a floor, broadcasters will live up to it. As you said before, there are many broadcasters that actually, because they're owned by families or they have a commitment to journalism, they really invest time um, and resources into doing true investigative reporting. And in fact, they've found that audiences respond to that, that, that it's not like they turn off the television or they go away. They're fascinated by it. They, they capture eyeballs. We know that the news segment is actually a big money maker for local television. So what we want to do is ensure that there is a level playing field and that there is a reinvestment in that local um, news making. And that starts with supporting the FCC's push to create some guidelines for the public interest obligation because, as you say, the, the airwaves belong to the public. We need to create that space by writing to our electeds, by writing to the FCC, by writing to President Obama and reminding them that this is something that we think is important. That that despite the erosion over the last 30 years, that now is the time for us to make a change when that window is open. The second is a very easy one, and I'm going to borrow this from Matthew Hale. Um, he talks about, uh, and, and we've experienced it too in working with our volunteer LA media group, um, when we were looking at whether broadcast stations were meeting their public interest obligations, what you do is you go to each one of those stations and you sign in and you ask to look at their, their files and through a very labyrinthian process you're led into a, a room where you're allowed to look at files and, and it's almost as if you're going to the Library of Congress to, to look at uh, uh, the last copy of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and it is, it is a process that, frankly, if we believe strongly that the public interest obligation should mean something, that the easiest thing for those stations to do would be to put it up on the web and then to send it to the FCC so that it can be all put into a single website so that the public can very easily see and judge for themselves whether our stations are meeting their obligations. I thought it was very interesting and Matthew, I'll leave you to tell some of the better stories, but in, in culling through those reports, USC found that some of the stories that were being uh, listed as meeting the public interest obligation included 40-some stories on the Michael Jackson death, um, a story about a wave washing somebody over in Maine. And here's what happens. When media consolidates, it becomes much easier to have a single story made about the oddball um, thing that, that has a lowest common denominator that anybody could watch and maybe be somewhat interested in. So you produce a story in Maine about a wave washing somebody off of a wall and then you can ship it across the country and plug in part of that 22 seconds of a news hole that was supposed to be dedicated to, um, uh, not the 22 seconds, but the, the, the news hole that was supposed to be dedicated to actual news. So openness and transparency in reporting putting those things on the web and then also filing it with the FCC. Um, the third is that we are hoping that the FCC, with its new composition, will step up to the plate and engage in an audit regularly of broadcasters. And, and by that we mean if they were to go through a process where randomly choosing 10% of broadcasters each year uh, to review their licenses in greater depth and then perhaps to create a probationary category uh, for those licenses that are not up to snuff, I think it would send a message to all broadcasters that we're watching, the public is watching, and it, it's time for them to live up to their public interest obligations. Uh, before I turn to the uh, veterans, I uh, just want to ask you, George, is that or is any of that something that <laughs> the Civic Alliance, which is a collection of pretty powerful people and uh, leaders in this, the community, would they consider any action? Yes. Um, and part of the question was how do we affect this sort of corporate enterprise where there are some very good journalists locally uh, uh, here who, who try to do their job, 
Uh, there are news directors who try to do their job. But how do you get at all of this? And I think that uh, we have decided that uh, – uh, inviting uh, Mike Copps was part of that and, uh, and, and this panel, but also probably weighing in and, uh, on license renewals uh, from now on with respect to our local television stations. Uh, we are going to have to determine how we do that, how we get others involved, Common Cause, the Urban League, the other members of our group. Uh, but I think that, uh, that, that that's going to be a position we're going to take. These are the public airways. You know you owe an obligation to the public interest here. And we're going to, uh, from our point of view, expect some more input on that process as, as we go forward. Thanks. So, Bob, is covering uh, government and uh, public affairs, is that ratings poison? Should stations be uh, keeping away from it because they'll lose? Of course not, but that's part of the mentality of the news decision makers who all through the years, part, most of the 40 years I've been in broadcast news, uh, believe that, um, that it is poison. Um, when you compare, it's interesting, when you compare newspapers to television and their decisions on what to cover, some of it is very basic. Uh, television is a video-driven entity that will naturally lean more towards stories that are visually compelling as opposed to a newspaper that gives you plenty of time to read it, to read an article and absorb it. Um, but I think the real, I think the real poison in all of this is endemic. It's in the culture of television news and the decision makers that have matured to this point of feeling they can say anything they want, do anything they want, and essentially present what we have called uh, all through the years, kicks, guts, and orgasms at 11, <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you can really add a fear factor to that as part of the cream. Uh, as it was well said, uh, it's like walking into a McDonald's when you watch the news locally, uh, eating a Big Mac, and coming out wondering why you're still hungry. Because the contact, content contains no value, no nutrition. And you are fooled many times into thinking that you're learning about your community when in, in, in truth you're not. The one good thing about local TV news is you can turn it off. And many people have because while it is still important to them as an important source of information on, on their lives, it is a situation where local TV news has worked its way into irrelevancy. Because when you watch local television news, there is very little that you can garner from that that affects your life. I think one important rule that local TV news has forgotten when it comes to lower ratings, which they're constantly struggling with, is that if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Local TV news decision makers keep digging the hole deeper because they are panicking. They are panicking because their audience is shrinking, and they will stoop to the lowest common denominator to keep your attention. And this started even before, I think, local TV news reached its, its, its apogee or, or its, its maturity, and it, and it started in the 70s in San Francisco. The kicks, guts, and orgasms that I referred to stand for KGO TV in San Francisco. <laughs> I was there then. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that was known as a toss to Marsha, I yes. believe. <laughs> I just want to leave you with this anecdote that in, in February of 1972, I believe, Van Amber, the local newscaster there, came on in the middle of the movie and teased Severed Penis at 11. No, no, You'll no. See the film. Penis oh, on Railroad Track. Uh, film right. at film 11. Film at 11. <laughs> it was transforming, <laughs> was it not? It was Joe? transforming. Yeah, Oregon found on Railroad Track. Film at 11. Film at 11. It, 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 it sounds better if you say Severed Penis. For those who uh, need the uh, <laughs> microphones, that was Male Organ Found on Railroad Track Film at 11. That's, that's a shout out to the webcast. Well, whatever it was, it was transforming because Van Emberg after that point, was commanding upwards of 60% of the viewing audience in San Francisco by doing stories of that nature, which they would later disclaim because there was a serious um, 
epidemic of murders of, of African Americans in San Francisco at the time they called the zebra murders, and they thought that there was a connection between a transient losing his organ and, and more devilish activity on the part of this group. Um, but it was transforming in the sense that when local stations began to see that they could be that provocative, suddenly the, the, the signal was, with the help of Frank Maggot and other consultants who were also feeding these news directors uh, tips on how to hold audience and feeding them formulas on how to hold audiences, um, they began to believe that the more notorious and the more sensational they could become, uh, the more they could hold on to this desperately white shrinking audience that they were trying to preserve. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Marcia because we, we were both uh, serving or trying to serve the public good at the time, and and I think feeling pretty good about what we were doing back in the in the 1980s and 1990s, when there was the big news in Los Angeles with Jerry Dunphy that went for maybe an hour, hour and a half that gave you good substantial community-based reporting. Reporters got three minutes to tell their story, almost unheard of in today's uh, TV market. So, um, so Marcia, you've had a chance. Uh, to get some perspective on your life in TV news. What's it look like to you now? Well, I'm very disturbed at what's happened today, and I don't think I need to um, decry what's gone on today when I look at my old station and I see that one of their big promotable stories was getting your Betty ready. Does anybody know what that is? Uh, it's getting uh, your bikini wax, uh, getting your legs shaved or whatever and uh, going to uh, a seance to talk to Michael Jackson after he died. I mean, the, the, it's really become horrific. But I do want to talk about a little bit about the past, because in an odd way, I think what we're saying is we sort of want to go back to the past a little bit, where we have FCC guidelines. What it was like when I was in a newsroom in the early days was that there was an FCC that was hanging over our head. You often heard, gee, our license, our license, we have a license that we have to defend. That's not good for the license. What are we doing to make, the, to make them think that we're doing good news? Whether, you know, whether they felt that we should be doing it or whether we had to do it because we had a, a, an oversight, an overseer. It didn't matter to us. We did those, uh, those stories. I will tell you a little bit about Van Amberg and the KGO News. Whereas, uh, it's not where I got started, but I did go there and I was his anchor partner. Van Amberg understood what the news was, but he also understood how to be P.T. Barnum. He knew that he did those, I used to call them away in a manger stories, uh, and he would tease 52 people dead in a bus accident. However, on the second story, or the third story, or the fourth story, it would be really something important to our community. So he knew that you had to gloss it and do substance underneath it. What's happened now is it's all the gloss, it's all getting people, and I don't think people really like it. We've dumbed down the audience so much, and now the only people who watch are really people who are interested in celebrity and crime, and we're giving them, or not we anymore, they're giving them what they think they want. Um, you know, back in 19, I don't even remember, I went to Norman Lear a very, very long time ago. This is what a genius he is. And I said, you know, Norman, I said, the TV news business is really starting to deteriorate. I'm worried about who's buying. I'm worried about the corporations. I'm worried that they're buying the news. And there are, uh, I have been asked in the news to do stories about uh, product, about, you know, to try to sneak it in. And I said, I think there's a series in this. And he said, yeah, he said, there is a series in this. Let's do it. It's called Good Evening, He Lied. <laughs> We never got it off the ground, but uh, I think it turned sort of into Murphy Brown a little bit. All I'm saying is here that um, we do have to go back. Um, if somebody, I always often say to students that I teach, if somebody came here from Mars and landed on our planet, and they watch a television news, uh, local news uh, program, what would they say about our society? Isn't the news supposed to reflect what's going on? Well, they would go back to Mars and they would say that we're obsessed with sex, we're obsessed with flashing lights, we're obsessed with uh, the most idiotic kinds of things that are going on that, that we pull out of our life, our daily life here in Los Angeles, and, and that's what we are. We have no thought about our situation. It has been my contention 
that you can do interesting news of a serious nature and get audiences. My bosses don't used to not agree with it. We did, when I first went to Channel 5, a 28-part series on um, what is good about the Los Angeles school system. I decided that I, instead of doing what's wrong, which we hear what's wrong and then everybody gets exhausted about what's wrong, let's talk about what's right and let's take those things that are right and try to create a model for what is a good school. And I gotta tell you, it got, it got almost no um, coverage by our newspapers. It would have been one of those series that would have been, meant something if anybody could have really watched, you know, if a lot of people would have watched it. In the end, it, uh, as Hal Fishman put it, this series idea that I had that we spent a lot of money on sunk him for those ra that rating period. That's the other thing. Why do we have to have rating periods? We know what every two seconds uh, tells us about the people watching now. So why put that on, uh, uh, on the stations anymore uh, to do these rating, these rating uh, you know, two weeks or one month of a ratings where they go to the lowest common denominator to get the most number of people? So yes, it's really terrible, but I, I'm going to make a plea to tell you that television news is, a, and when I first started, was a force for the good and can still be a force for the good if we can get the leaders of these corporations to understand the responsibility that they have to the people of this country. But that's, this is endemic in our country. Nobody thinks that they're responsible anymore. George? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on, on your analogy with Mars. Uh, I think what they would think is that one out of every four people is attacked every day. That's right. And that tw you know, why would you ever come to a country that was so violent, uh, and a city that is so violent throughout, that 25% of, of the world is devoted to, to crime? I would also, one, one thing I would want to say about going backward, I, I don't see it as going backward. I, I see it as going to first principles that take us forward. Because there are changes, we are moving, we're moving ahead. So it's too easy to rebut the notion we want to go backward by saying, "Hey, the, the world is moving forward." But we do have to go back to first principles that you talked about, uh, Mike Cops. Um, and I think that gets back to the only way to deal with this, uh, or one of the certain ways to deal with this, is the imposition of uh, uh, by the FCC of these guidelines and then a requirement for them to be part of a license examination and license renewal. It puts everybody on the same plane from, an, from a fairness point of view. It's like everybody's got to have seat belts. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got to have K-12 education. And then you're not worrying about competing against a fellow channel for them in a different way. You're on the same ground wave. So uh, I, I applaud you in those efforts and I, and I hope you'll go in that direction. There are a lot of good people in Los Angeles, got good reporters that are trying to cover things now and, and, and they're just not capable, they're not permitted to do so. Well, I, I just wanted to add um, that um, when it comes to reporting on, on government, whether it be on the local county or, or state issue, I, I've had the best of both worlds. I have lived a journalistic life, but now I'm dealing with public policy and how you translate that public policy to the media so that they understand it clearly and are able to disseminate it. It's, it's increasingly difficult these days to do that because there is a disconnect or distrust between politicians, elected politicians, and what they see as a pretty idiotic TV market that will really not listen to them. So what we've been work doing working in the Senate and soon we'll be working on this new select committee on television and film industries, is we're going to try to see if there are ways that we can cross-pollinate much easier between what the politician is trying to do and say and uh, make it easier for the reporter to understand it. Now, we don't have to educate the newspaper people because they are institutional in Sacramento. They understand it. But these young reporters that are now coming to Sacramento uh, infrequently in trying to understand a $19 billion state budget uh, and ways to get out of that and, and, and uh, term limits, uh, two-thirds vote requirement on the budget. These are very complex issues that are not easily understood. And, and I think it, it also uh, really uh, weighs on the responsibility of government to, to really help reporters better than they have in the past. Any uh, comments or questions from the room? Norman. 
I would like to ask Mr. Keeper, wouldn't it be possible, or shouldn't it be possible, uh, to mount a class action suit on behalf of the American people, perhaps against the Congress, for the poor way it's handled the public interest vis-a-vis -vis the public airways? Well, it's an interesting approach. Um, uh, it, uh, I'm not a, a class action lawyer nor a media lawyer, um, but I, I think uh, it's not surprising that the theater of that by itself uh, would, would uh, draw the kind of attention whether or not it was successful even in the end. So I think it's a, it's a legitimate question uh, that one ought to be looked at. Uh, the mere filing of such a suit um, it may be enough to, just as we say... It may be enough to make the news. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we'll see how much any of this makes the news. Tracy? Um, well, since uh, uh, Marty and Matt have found eight minutes of local news, I have a short list of eight recommendations to improve local news. Um, um, uh, how about if you... Uh, would you yeah. swing that chair over there and uh, just come to that mic? Because I want other people to hear it. Um, this is Tracy Weston from the Center for Governmental Studies and uh, the Annenberg School of Faculty. Um, I, can, I can think of eight things to do to improve local news. First, some are FCC, some are local. First, I think we ought to reinstate an FCC requirement that broadcast stations do five minutes of news every hour, at least for radio. We used to have that until 1980s, and anyone who was listening to radio would always hear the news on the hour. That's now gone. I think we should reinstate it. Secondly, I think we ought to have news criteria and license renewal processes. Why don't we say, for instance, that 5% of all of the revenues or expenses of a station need to be devoted to news? The FCC can collect revenue figures. Just look at how much they invest in news. That's a good objective test. Third, any time a, a station is transferred or sold, uh, the FCC ought to look to see whether the buyer has a history of doing less news than the seller. If that's the case, don't approve the transfer. Fourth. Uh, shorter license renewals. We used to have three-year license renewals, now they're eight. Let's go back to three to five. At least we can look at them more frequently and it will begin to increase the sense that there is some responsibility. Fifth, I think the FCC and Congress should look at the possibility of free time for candidates and uh, even ballot measure committees. There are ways to do it in light of Citizens United, which says that corporations can spend unlimited amounts of money on political campaigns. Maybe one solution is to get uh, more free time for candidates and so the public can hear directly from them. Sixth, I think there's some local things we can do. There is a channel in LA that does a lot of news. It's Channel 35, which is the city's channel. But the local broadcast stations don't take that feed, don't work with the content, uh, don't take the news that actually covers city council and what the city's doing. They ought to build a partnership. For instance, the, there's a 24-hour uh, city news channel or city channel and um, local media does not index the content of that channel. It just simply says government programming instead of what specifically is on, so if nobody knows what's on. Seventh, I think um, all of television stations in LA now have extra digital channels, three or four of them. Why don't we encourage them to pool their resources and use one of them to cover local news, local public affairs, local issues? They have the capacity for the first time in history uh, but so before it's filled up with soap operas and quiz shows, let's see if we can get one of them or maybe a, a cooperative to do a, to dedicate a digital channel to local news. And finally, why don't we encourage them, maybe George can work on this, to take all local news coverage from all the channels and put it into a single video on demand indexed website mm -hmm. so we can at least access it. At least you can go back and say, what happened last week? and look at this website and find the few seconds that do exist and at least see them when you want to see them. Thank you. Now, I would say one last thing. This problem is going to get worse. There was a study that, that's asked people, how much do you know about government? And it's been run for over 20 years, in 1989 through 2009. And it turns out that in 1989, when there were no three news channels, no digital television, to, uh, uh, direct television satellites to speak of, and no internet, People knew more about government in 1989 than they do today. So we're swimming in information and no less. Uh, and on top of that, television news follows 
the local newspaper. That's how they get their stories. Well, local newspapers are going away. And if that's the case, we could expect to have even worse local news. So we have to focus, I think, both at the federal level and at the local level on improving local news, or we will, it'll have catastrophic impacts on our system of democracy and governance. Mm -hmm. Any else? Uh, top you. Hi. Um, I'm with the LA Media Reform Group. And um, our thing for our summit this year is preserving democracy. And one of the things that really concerns me about what's been said tonight is I also have a background in education. And before, uh, before LAUSD went through these massive budget cuts, they were beginning to focus on teaching critical thinking. And I was an advocate of that because I kept, I kept saying, if our students are not critical thinkers when they become adults, then they will buy whatever ad tells them. They will buy the slickest commercial to make their decision. Now that I'm seeing that eight minutes of every half hour is spent on ads, I'm thinking when it's in, and now we have these budget cuts and, and critical thinking is on the back burner. Now we have the risk of our future because the students who are in school now are not learning to be critical thinkers and they're coming into a system where all their most of their information is coming from paid advertisements. And, and I think putting corporations in charge of giving us the information is one of the most dangerous things to our democracy. Speaking of students, we have some students here. I'm wondering if any of you uh, is uh, thinking about a career in, in journalism and how this uh, strikes you. <clears throat> any, any comment from a student? Yes. I'm not considering journalism um, itself, but I am looking towards political consulting and dealing with journalism and media and public issues. And my question was regarding um, those small uh, percentage of local news that's being covered, how much of that is of diverse coverage? Is that just one story that's being repeated throughout the whole entire market, or is that several of the stories that each station kind of tailors to each? That, that's, a, that's a very good question. And, and one of the things that the FCC, in addition to localism, um, uh, finds important is the diversity of stories. Um, as, as we said, this is sort of our first cut through the data, and so I can give you some sort of anecdotal. There are certain stories that are across all stations. You know, everyone covered a certain number of, of, of stories. Um, uh, and I would say that, that there's, a, so there's a fair amount of overlap or, or not a lot of diversity. But I also did find a lot of um, stories only on one channel or only on, on two channels. So um, I, I don't get the sense that it is um, monolithic across all of the stations. I do think that there is some uh, differences in the way that, that stations um, uh, cover the news. So um, I think that's an important question to look at in the future. And, and one of the great things about, um, and, and Tracy mentioned, having a database of actual video content is that we can go back over time and look at that. And creating a, a, a database, um, uh, whether it's video on demand or whether it's it, as part of a licensing um, uh, process, seems to me to be sort of an interesting uh, uh, notion to think about is that as part of the licensing process, should television stations be required not just to do the public file forms, but to do actual video? And if they provided actual video, then, we're de then we, we would have it to look at. We could debate what's civic or what's not civic, but at least we would have the content itself where people could look at it. Um, so maybe that's a, 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 a way of of moving forward as well. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I've been in public relations in this town for 40 years, and I'm as mad as hell. Uh, this medium of uh, media has changed so much. I've got enough notes here to probably write a book. Um, one thing we need to do immediately is, is break up the monopoly of the uh, stations. To have a new, one newsroom take care of two news stations, like Channel 2 and Channel 9. Uh, channel 11, Channel 13, and you've got Channel 13 re rebroadcasting all the programs on Channel 11. And you go on and on and on. Break that up. I mean, you have 45% control of, of uh, you know, a, a major metropolitan uh, access to 45% to of the population, basically, through the control of the media is, is a death knell to democracy, basically. That's number one. The other thing that, that the stations are doing, you can't get a hold of these people. 
you know, I'm sitting with Dynamite Stories, because we handle a, not, a lot of nonprofits. I've got a story on, on female veterans you know, that I can't sell to anybody. You know why? I can't get through to them. Used to be a day, I used to go to, to my desk, walk in, put a story on her desk, and walk out. I used to do the same thing with the LA Times. You know, I was able to talk even to a reporter. Now you can't even get me on the front gate. Even KTLA has changed now. You can't get a hold of anybody directly. Now they have news tip. Email the news tip. Okay. And then when you try to get a hold of the station, you get a voicemail. Who would you like to talk to? This and that. Or go to the directory. Well, about 10 minutes later, the directory doesn't work. KPPC, KPCC, I just had that problem over there. And you can't get a hold of these people. <coughs> When you do get a hold of them, and this is, this is just a couple of my notes here, you've got assignment editors on the desk that have no knowledge about critical thinking. They don't know anything about history. They don't know anything about geography. They don't know anything about political science. They don't know anything. You think you're talking to a high school student. <laughs> and you are. You know, they're probably a volunteer or something, or somebody that's, uh, you know, getting uh, about $8 an hour or whatever. How can you sell a story of intelligence to somebody who is a gatekeeper for the news? I mean, you know, those are just a couple of issues. I Thank have. you. I can go on forever, Thank but I don't want to take most of your time. But I've been in this town for a long time, and I'll tell you, it's getting very frustrating. And right now, when I have a client, the first thing I ask them, number one, do you have a celebrity who can speak for you? That's number one. Number two, do you have somebody who's gay who's threatening who's going to jump off a building? Hey, great. Get that person, you know. That's the only bit of good news, he says. And if I do get through, it's like, and finally tonight, we have a, we have a story about this kitten in New Zealand who happened to fall off somebody's lap and is now drinking milk with one paw. And, 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 and. I mean, that's, that's all you get. I mean, and again, I, I'm sorry. I Thank you. No, I appreciate that. that. It's the you know, voice of hard experience. Time. It's very, very frustrating. Uh, one last question from the, from the audience. Then uh, I'll uh, conclude. It, it strikes me that the the piece that's missing in all this is that the people who own the licenses and run these companies think that their responsibility is only to their shareholders. It's fine to make a profit. They are in a commercial business, but they are in a special commercial business, which for two reasons. One is it's protected by the First Amendment. And the other is that they are getting billions of dollars of free spectrum owned by the public in exchange for a deal. But that deal which says, we give you free spectrum, you give us service to the public interest, that deal is something that they've forgotten about. And I hope today that we were able to remind them. I want to I want to close by thanking uh, the the Lear Center staff who has done such a great job. But there's one member of the staff in particular who, as a newlywed, has been working nights and weekends for months. And so I want to thank him for the sacrifice, Adam Rogers. And thank you all.